Welcome to another episode of the Gap Down Backer podcast. Um, we are back with another episode. Uh, we have Coach uh, Stephen C. Aussie uh, with us. He's the run game coordinator and offensive line coach at Bryant University. Coach, how are you doing? Doing great. Uh, appreciate you having me on. Love what you're doing on this podcast, Coach. Thank you, Coach. I, I, I appreciate it. Um, before we get into anything, we're, like I said, we'll talk pass pro and um, obviously, coaches, if you want to check out any, any of this, you can go back through the tags at the below, check out the sponsor affiliates, all that stuff is below. Uh, coaches' Twitter, so you can give them a follow. Um, but before we get into our actual pass pro stuff today, um, can you kind of give your background on how you ended up, Brian, kind of your career path up to this point? Yeah. So, um, played my college football at Wagner College um, in New York City. Uh, which is ironically in the same league as Bryant University in the, in the Northeast Conference. Um, you know, coming out of high school, I played my high school ball in Pennsylvania. Um, loved it. Uh, grew up down south, moved up north. Uh, when I finished high school, I knew I wanted to, to, to be a coach at that time. I thought I was going to be high school coaching. Wound up getting to Wagner. Uh, played there, for, you know, four years. Uh, going into my, my last year, it was my fifth, uh, fifth season, my fifth year of eligibility. Um, I kind of started seeing some friends of mine uh, that were graduating. So, like, I was graduating, but I had my, the next fall to come back and start my master's. And there was a lot of my teammates that were graduating that I remember, like, when that final whistle hit that final game and then when that – and then when graduation hit, it was kind of like one of those weird things where, like, they were like, I don't know what to do with my life. And, like, <laughs> you really think about it, like – and it kind of made me think, like, as, as a football player – we spend our entire, once we start playing, it really becomes your life, right? You have family, we do stuff, all that at school, but like the amount of hours you train and work and everything like that. And so I used to think the biggest impact I could make was I'm gonna be a high school coach, like my, my high school coach, uh, Gary Rodenbach, who did an unbelievable job helping me become a better young man, a better human being. Um, and I said, you know what? I said, like, I think in college, I can get my fix for coaching football, which is what I know I wanna do. Um, but I can help guys when they get to that next stage in life, become a better person, become a father one day, a husband, be a better man, and just be ready for like the professional world and yeah. and like that feeling. So, got done senior year, uh, got really lucky, won the Northeast Conference Championship, went into the playoffs, had success early in the playoffs, lost in the second round. Um, I didn't have a job, anything like that. I had started my master's. I walked into the head coach's office, um, Walt Hamlin. Um, who was also the AD, and I, I said to him, I said, Coach, I want to coach. And he was like, listen, like, I don't hire former players. Uh, you got to go somewhere else before you come back. Came back in the next day, I said, no, like, I, I want to coach. So he was like, fine, I'll do it. Um, made me the O-line GA. Uh, so I did my first year uh, coaching in 2013 as the assistant offensive line coach at Wagner. Uh, learned a lot. Um, that O-line coach left. My line coach had been gone that year after we won the title in 12. He came back, um, made me the tackles and tight ends coach. Got to work alongside an unbelievable staff of guys that are all over college football now. Um, and that was year two. And the best thing about that was coaching tight ends gave me a completely different perspective of the game. As an old lineman, I never cared about passes. I never cared <laughs> about routes. All of a sudden now, instead of one-on-ones, I'm down at seven-on-seven. Seven, and I remember going through spring ball, just being like, what am I doing? Um, but, man, like, you talk about a position that teaches you about the entire offense, it's tight end. You know, having to learn the pass game, still having to coach those guys like old linemen. And it was awesome doing that in year two. And I got to work alongside um, Stefan Wheeler, who's the offensive line coach, ironically, in the same state at the uh, University of Rhode Island. Um, he was our offensive line coach. And got to work with him and see what Steph did and, and learned a lot. We were fortunate in 14. We shared the NEC title. Um, awesome year, awesome team. When that got done, my, my master's was completed. I just finished my MBA. Uh, so I was looking for, for a job. Uh, I knew I wanted to get my own room. So in February of 2015, uh, I got hired at Pace University, uh, which is a D2 in Westchester, New York by Andy Rondo. Um, spent one year there as the offensive line coach, learned more about recruiting and what it takes to be a detailed football coach from Coach Rondo than anyone else I've worked for in my entire time coaching. Uh, he held you incredibly accountable. Um, you had to be incredibly detailed 
he's actually the guy that kind of got me shifting from, I used to be like, I draw diagrams of like drills and stuff like that. And I remember him sitting down with me one day and he's like, what kid is going to look at a stick figure diagram? And I had seen this from like big time online coaches had done this. So I was just copying it. He was like, what kid in today's day and age really is going to look at that? Like find a different way to, to, to get kids to understand what the drill is. And so that's when I started filming stuff. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to take my phone and film myself doing it. Filmed a couple of players. And that's why I started doing diagrams, stuff like that, pictures um, of actual stuff. And so he kind of just got those wheels turning. He made it so that if you had, if you present a recruit to the staff, you better know not only the, the mother's name, father's name, occupation, brother, sister, you better know the cousins. Did he have a girlfriend? How was he doing with his girlfriend? Like you needed to know all that. Um, so I loved it. It taught me so much. Uh, so I was there one year. Um, was going into year two in July. My former old line coach is now the head coach at Wagner, uh, Jason O'Talon, uh, who's now with the Tennessee Titans um, in, a, in a quality control role, working with the old line. He called me in July and, you know, I figured he was just calling me, I wish me luck for the upcoming season. And he said, hey, I have a job for you. And so I'm thinking to myself, well, I just got off the phone with Steph. He, you know, he's still there. So I'm like, it's not the old line. He's like, I want you to come back and be the D line coach. And I was like, okay. like you know what, like, you know, let me think about this. Um, he's like, on top of that, I want you to be a recruiting coordinator. I'm like, okay, well, this is really intriguing. And then he's like, and on top of that, you're gonna be the special teams coordinator. <laughs> and I, I remember it's like two weeks for camp and I'm like, I've never coached special teams that's ever been playing in my life. Yeah. Um, and he's like, I trust you. You're going to learn it. You're going to do it. So I went back, took the job. Um, again, like just a completely different mentality, coaching D line. Which really, if you coach O line, you can coach D line. Yeah. In my opinion, if you're if you coach D line, I believe you can coach O line. Like if, if you buy in and learn the the why and how you do things, and it makes you better going when you go back to that side of the ball. But coaching special teams was the cool one of the coolest things I've ever done because it made me have to coach every type of kid and every kid yeah. on the team. So like I never coached receivers or DBs um, or linebackers, you know. But now like I have all these kids in my meeting room. I, I've got I've got to go talk to those kids in the locker room. I've got to get, and that was awesome because as O line coaches, I think we're all in the same mentality. Like our O line is our O line. Like you know, screw the rest. We're not really worried about everyone else. Um, so that was awesome. Flipped my mentality of how I coach. I'm now that I was teaching how to attack it. Yeah. So I did that for two years. Loved it. Um, started getting the itch to go back to O line. Like I knew, you know, long term, I said I want to be an O line coach. It's what I play. It's what I am. Um, I still had some eligibility left to be a one AGA, but I was running out of my clock, you know, and uh, a lot of young coaches don't know that you have seven years when you're done playing, whether it's in college, the league, but whenever you complete your graduation, you're done playing, you have a seven year clock to be a one AGA. So like I was near the end of that. So I started putting out feelers. I was reaching out to people, reaching out to people. And then Alan Mogridge, uh, who was the old line coach at the time at Florida International University, FIU down in Miami. Now he's at University of South Florida. Um, him and I had known each other for a while. My first year in coaching, I went to every Temple camp. He was the old line coach there. Um, I would bother him, bother, bother him, and he would let me do the drills. And he started letting me come around and watch film and talk the ball. And him and I started be, developing a good relationship. I got on the phone with him. And I was like, listen, I'm trying to be an old line GA. You know, I'm, I'm looking anywhere if you know anybody. And he's like, well, heck, you know, come down here. We're looking for one. So I left a full-time job, coordinating job, the FCS level. I packed everything um, in my car and uh, drove the 20 hours down to Florida. I uh, got the, you know, interviewed uh, and then drove down 20 hours. I got the job after the interview. And then spring ball started three days after I got the job. So I had three days to pack my stuff, drive all the way down. And I got there the night before spring ball. Um, and that was where I learned the most amount of football, uh, at FIU got to work under a uh, legendary coach and coach Davis, Butch Davis, um, Alan Mulgridge is one of the top offensive line coaches in the country. Yeah. He taught me more about technical details, mentality of how you have to practice, you know, uh, Rich Sprosky, the OC taught me more about football than anyone in this profession. Um, so it was just an unbelievable thing. And then coaching at the one they level, we had a heck of a team, um, was there for a year, won the Bahamas bowl, uh, loved it. I, and then I got a call, you know, we're practicing for the bowl game. Uh, we're getting ready to go down to Bahamas and I get a call from my current head coach, uh, coach Merritt, Chris Merritt. 
And he tells me, hey, I'm interviewing for the Bryant job. Him and I know each other for a while. He said, if I get it, would you be interested? And I said, yeah. I said, I'd definitely be interested. It's a full-time O-line job at the FCS level. You know, I didn't know if he was going to get it or not. I was kind of in bowl practice, so I wasn't too worried. Um, he winds up getting it. He comes down to the Bahamas. Him and I talk down in the Bahamas um, um, during our bowl practices. He sells me on it. We get back. And, and next thing I know, you know, I'm packing all my stuff up from Miami, and I'm driving now 24 hours up to Rhode Island. So it was it was a nice transition. It was 85 when I left. It was eight degrees when I got here. So it was a little bit different, but that's kind of, uh, you know, that's my story. You know, it's been, it's been awesome. It's been yeah. coaching multiple positions, all sides of the ball, but getting back to what I want to do, which is offensive line. Good coach. No, no, I understand that completely. And, and obviously our careers, especially in this profession, take a, a interesting turn and evolution. All of us kind of have different paths and, they're all kind of unique the way they are. Um, I, I do want to start getting past pro though, and and kind of my, my first question: where where do you start with your kids? Like, obviously every year is a new year, and you usually have a decent amount of returning kids year from year. But where do you when you're teaching pass pro technique? What where do you start? Yeah, absolutely. The first the first thing to me is it's always going to be your foundation. So. Before we even talk about even stance in the off season, in the weight room, all that, we're going to talk about how to bend. So like there's three levels of it that we talk about. We talk about our hips, our knees and our ankles. And to be good in pass pro, you've got to be able to play with your hips sunk. You've got to be able to play with your knees inside your ankles and you've got to be able to play in the insteps of your feet. So like, that's the first thing, like, we, you know, we'll get a lot of guys in, in, in recruiting or guys you inherit on a roster, like they're not ready made. And the first thing everyone wants to do is get out on the field and like, I'm going to start doing pass sets. Like I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get out there. I'm going to do punch, right? We're going to do independent hands. Uh, all the things that I love and you don't want to talk about, but like we will literally just get in the stance and we'll do flexibility work over and over. So the first thing I'll have them do is get in the stance, just get down. Okay. What is your stance? I think the, the biggest mistake that I learned, you know, growing up when I was younger, full line was like, everyone says your feet gotta be shoulder width apart. And well, that, that's great if I'm six foot or 5'11". What if I'm 6'2"? What if I'm 6'6"? Yeah. Six, six? What about like my, well, one of my young tackles here, he's 6'8". Like, well, shoulder width apart for him probably isn't gonna get it done how long his legs are. So like, everyone's different. So like, I'll, I will I will work individually with everyone, and that to me has to happen more in the off season. It obviously will happen when freshmen come in and everything like yeah. that. But like your gains that you do with that are happening in the weight room in January, in February, in March, pre spring ball. Okay. Um. So that's the first thing. So we we'll, we will start with stance before we ever do any movement. It'll be just bending down, getting comfortable with stance learning to feel where I need to put my feet and my body to be in position to succeed. Okay. Now, now have you found kind of, kind of building off that? Have you found that the taller you are, the wider the feet get? Is that kind of the common theme or that, does that even still vary? I, I would say more times than not. Yes, but it, 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 it definitely varies to me. It's all about their, their hip and knee flexibility in terms of like, where where how wide their base have to be like if you've got really really tight hips well maybe you can't just sink down like naturally with with yeah. a tighter base but wind it out to help the body sink down vice versa if, if you've got very flexible ankles well you can you can help alleviate some of that pressure with with a tighter base you know so uh, again to me it's it's like the age of every line coach say it like we talk six inch steps everything like that i think you can't pigeonhole guys into like specific things so but generally the taller guys you'll see them in, in a little bit more uh wider wider bases you know we watch the, the thing you have to be careful is you guys are going to watch the nfl and they're going to see some of those guys with the, the very elongated yeah. stances they're going to want to practice that you're going to be like oh, all right easy now um so i don't know that's a good point i, I get it coach and, and like so that's always interesting i, I think that's something that's uh, at least a generation of, of, of our, at least our generation and has kind of started figuring out, okay, we got to adjust more our players. It's not that old hard fast. Okay. You have to do it exactly like this. Um, 
So obviously, so like kind of building off that, you said hip and ankle flexibility. You're not the first coach I've heard, especially talk about ankle flexibility. Um, I've heard a D line coach say the same thing this this off season. Um, but how how do you how do you actually work on that? Is is it flex? Is that true? Like stretching and flexibility? Is there specific drills? Is it yoga? What, I mean, what what are what are what are you doing? To, to work on those movements and the ability to be flexible. Yeah, you know, it it definitely starts with stretching. Um, you know, just base, you know, hips, hips are pretty easy, right? So like, you know, hips you can do, right? You can just sink down, you can do different stuff where you, where you spread the legs, lean back. Um, to me, like when you look at knee flexibility and ankle flexibility, that's when like the band work becomes like really big, you know, like wrapping the bands around, working different rotations, working different roles um, with bands around those areas, you know, putting pressure. So you, you're having resistance, teaching your knee and your ankles how to move with that. And then the biggest thing to me is with the ankle flexibility, you have to get in a stance and just work movement off your insteps constantly. And that, that is, like we, we met this morning as an old line, we were doing some indie stuff, you know, you know, pre lift. And um, like I said to the young guys, I'm like, guys, this is thousands of repetitions. Mm -hmm. Like some people know how many and all that. I don't know, but like, I tell them like it, it is. Um, and this was also awesome thing that last night, um, you know, coach Y came down and was clinking us, which hit home. He said, if I told you to stand up and go open that door, right? Could you do that easy? Yes. Okay. That's because you've done it thousands of times in your life. Yeah. When, when you get done work and drive home, you don't think about how to drive the car. You just get behind the wheel, you put the key in and you just go, well, that's because you, you've learned it. If you remember your first time driving, it took me three times to get my license, you know? <laughs> and the third time the guy went out and asked my dad if he wanted me behind the wheel of the car. He's like, I don't know if he's ready. <laughs> so it literally takes practice. Yeah. Um, so that the third phase to me is actually getting and drilling it. Okay. Now uh, you also, I, I got a variety of questions. You mentioned earlier wh while you're talking about your background and I, I wrote this down, I figured I'll just hit this now is, is, is getting rid of the old stick figure drawings. Now is that, is, is it, tr you just showed true film beforehand or is, cause I think you said something about pictures or true diagrams. How's that look? And in a meeting room when you're teaching the drills? Obviously some are Absolutely. easier than other because you've had kids, they know the drill, but especially for your newer kids um, that haven't done it as much or ha or you haven't done this drill in a while per se. Yeah, so um, I'll talk about it and then I'm gonna show example if okay. you don't mind. The, um, that like, that, that like, I, I remember that, I'll never forget that. So it was young coach, 2015, I, I had taken this O-line mail that previous O-line coach kind of made and, made it my own but like i remember when i had so much respect for this guy and he had given it at, at a clinic and i walked in and coach rondo always collected everyone's manuals preseason to see it and he sees mine he's like what is this he's like like okay he's like you give this to me i'm an eighth grade old, old lineman how am i gonna know what to do he's like like i said well you know the stick for, yeah i look at that like the circle and the yeah the little two little, and he's like he's like I, I don't know what that is steve and i was like well i got all these words and he's like He's like, do you think kids in today's generation read words? And I just remember, like, I went home and I was, like, pissed. I was like, man, I put in hours of work on this. And I said, okay, well, hold on. Like, this really makes sense what he's saying. So, like, what I do now, do you mind if I share this? Go, go, do what you need to, coach. So, I'll literally film it. And if my guys have never done it, I will film it. Um, can you see that okay? Yeah, that's good, coach. And I'll, I'll literally take a screenshot, I'll cut out the picture, and then I'll show the different phases of it, and I'll just talk through, okay, what is the objective of the drill, how many times should they do it, what is the relativeness of the game, what is the coaching point, and this is where I kind of talk through it, and everything I give my guys now is digital, so like whether you use Huddle, we use Thundercloud here, I use Google Drive as well, and so I'll have like an image like this, and then I'll just have them doing the different drills and it'll be video clips. And again, if, if you're taking a new job and you don't have video of this, I literally, my roommate, uh, coach Hawkins, our receivers coach, he'll come out and film it with me. And that's what he did back when I was at Pace. And it's just literally, this is <laughs> us doing it in the snow. So I, I, I like putting up here, uh, just kind of a funny clip, but literally 
they'll get this video of, of them doing it with the coaching point, um, all the coaching points that are in the slide. So rather than just like a diagram of what the drill should look like, film it, give them visual, show them what it is, Okay. You know, and that way you can talk through them. And then I'll always finish it with some type of clip at the end. So, like, it'll be something like right here where I'll highlight who they're, you know, here's the drill in action. Here's the line sets in action that you guys are doing. So okay. um, that's something that I love. Um, I, and, and Coach Rondo taught me that and, like, made me a better coach for that. Now, now that that brought up another interesting question for me. Just watching that is in in your pat. Let, let's let's start breaking down pass pro. Is, is what do you? I mean, obviously we we want good ankle flexibility. We want our hips low um, or down, however you want to phrase it. But what do you tell them when they start take their initial steps? What does that that process look? Say you're a first time a line coach or a high school or middle school line coach. What are, what do you start talking with and before we even get to hands is what foot, footwork and hips. How does that initial process work? What, what are your ideal coaching points there? Yeah. So first thing I tell them is like, what is, it's all about your approach. So like when you, when you get lined up, what is the play? What do I, okay. So I have the play. I have my assignment. Am I in the zone side? I'm on the man side. Okay. Break all that down. Once you know what you need to do, what is the objective of my set going to be? Like, how am I going to set for success? And that's the big thing we talk about nonstop is set for success. So it's all about angles. So yeah. we talk about where is the quarterback's launch point? So in this protection, is he behind the center? Is it sprint out? Is it half roll? Is it gap protection where he's going to be drifting a little bit? Where is the launch point? Where am I in relation to that launch point in the protection? Am I on the zone side way away so I'm not as worried? Am I on the man side where I know I don't have help on the inside by the guard? So like all those things play a critical factor in how I'm going to approach the set. And then from a fundamental standpoint, there are six main things that kind of encompass all that, that I just said we talked about. The first thing is your set. Speed out your stance. We are going to create distance in all of our sets. Whether that's a vertical set, whether that's a lateral set where the distance now I'm creating is laterally getting on the guy and taking away his move. Um, we're always going to have leverage. We always want to be inside out of the defender. So when if I'm going against a man, my eye on his, so my outside eye and his inside eye, near V of the neck, I'm always intersecting that with my kick foot or my post, if I'm posted down a guy, intersecting his crotch right down the middle. And then when we talk about the hands part, that's the third thing, our hands are going to be low to start, ready to strike, whether that's it's on my, my knees, whether it's in front, whether it's stacked, however, however you teach your hands, and everyone teaches them differently. I'm, I'm a big believer, and I start low, ready to strike. And then we get into the next thing. It's just reaction, change of direction, mirroring yeah. the defender. That's why everyone loves basketball players. We, we have to be able to redirect. We have to be able to stay in front. Um, and then the last two things is finish. You know, owning yeah. your man, never excuse to give up and sack. And then again, it goes back to at the end of the day, know your why. Why is the defense aligning a certain way? What does that mean for us as a unit? Okay. So all that, all that encompasses that. Now, you, you mentioned vertical and lateral sets there. How, how different is that from a teaching perspective and a time perspective for you? Yeah, so it, it, it again, to me, I will teach both from day one. Okay. Uh, I'm a big believer in both. I know some people live in the world of um, – I don't teach vertical or I only teach short. I don't teach short. We're getting back. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, I believe you have to set for, you know, again, it goes back to set for success. So if a defender's wide, your initial thought should be, okay, I probably need to set vertical because from an angle, like understanding angles, if I set out to him and miss, well, he's already by me. So I, if I'm going to go out to him, I need to be pretty, pretty damn good as an O-liner. If he's tight, 
and I set vertical, well, now I'm just giving the inside. So like it all, it all is, it starts with where is he, what's his alignment, how am I going to set for success? And then as you get more experience as an alignment, now it turns into, well, how can I break the rules so he doesn't get tendencies? You know, so how do I, well, he's wide, but I'm a better athlete. So I am going to quick set and get out there right now and get on him because I know the snap count. That's a resource he doesn't have. I know that his first step is slow. You know, um, I'm going to vertical set because he's not a quick change direction guy. So even if he goes inside, I still have time to get back, post inside, take it away. And I'm trying to get him to do that, right? Like one of our tackles is really good at that. Like he's not a heavier guy. So like, he's going to quick set everybody. He's going to try to get on quicker, you know, very rarely will he vertical set, you know, third and long situation, but he's going to use his athleticism and stop that. Sometimes you're a heavier guy. Like for me, I played tackle in college, but I was a heavier guy. I wasn't as fast. So I was going to get back, deny your speed rush and make you go inside and then use my 300 pounds on you. So yeah. it's, it's all about the tools in your toolbox, knowing what to use, when to use it, all that. Now, when you're vertical setting, what do you tell your linemen in terms of, of reaching and um, their footwork so they're not losing, I don't know, leverage is probably a bad word, um, but I think you kind of get where I'm going with that. Yeah. You know, um, first thing I tell everyone, it's kind of, it's kind of corny. I make all linemen do this. So um, I'll have them stand up straight, right? Yeah. And kind of like a zombie. And I'll have them put both arms out. And I'll have them like line up against somebody just like this. And I'll say, okay, touch his shoulder. And I'll touch his shoulder. And then I'll have that guy reach, try to grab him. I'm like, okay, whose arms are longer? It, it always helps better if the guy grabbing your shoulder is a little longer because it's like, okay, well, he can reach you. And in general, most yeah. guys still can get on you. And then I'll say, okay, now take this hand. So this is my far hand and drop it and just extend with one. And I'm like, okay, what are you now? I'll coach, I'm longer. You're always longer with one. And that's where like the whole independent hands part comes in. So what I tell my guys is if they're only giving, you got to strike what they give you. So yeah. like if they're not giving you uh, a big target, don't strike with two. Like, cause if you strike with two, they're going to take two and now they're by you. If they're giving you a big target, right? Bull rushes, speed to power, tight alignment, strike with two. Don't let him get out of that. You know, use your power. Um, so when it comes to like a vertical set, again, it, it's based on what their what their goal is, what their plan is as, as a defense, and what they give you to strike. Okay. Now, the flip side of that, I believe as an offensive lineman, your mentality has to be you're the aggressor. Like I think too much when you watch linemen, it's one of the, one of the biggest things when I watch high school linemen on film. I like seeing guys that are aggressive throwing their hands and like get on guys, even even if they fail. Like I'm good with them. Like okay, this kid's not afraid to throw his hand. Guys that just sit back and wait and wait to see what move the D-line does, I don't think you can be very successful. you got to get the defensive lineman to get to his second move. So you got to defeat the first, or you have to prevent from ever getting to the first. So we talk about winning with hands first all the time. Win with your hands. Okay. Now let's kind of expand on that. And not only when you're setting, but just in general, what what are your main coaching like? If you had to highlight two, three coaching points for hand use hands in general, what do you what do you kind of focus on? Yeah, so I focus on a couple of things. When you talk about the near hand, so if I'm right tackle my right hand, we talk about from a strike aiming point. We never want to strike if you're going independent hand. I never want to strike the near half of the body of the defender. Because again, if he takes that away, now I've lost everything and my far hand can't get involved. So our aim and point for that near hand is that far peck armpit area. We want to strike across the guy's body. My foot, my kick foot is still intersecting his crotch or vice versa. I'm posting down the guy. I'm still intersecting his crotch. My head is near via the neck inside to me. So I'm not going past him, but that's our aim point. So our near hand is our high hand. Our far hand is our low hand. So what does that mean? As I'm throwing that hand high, my low hand is catching, right? He defeats that move. I'm hitting that hip, washing him up. I go to punch, he goes aside. Well, now I got that low hand to catch him. Um, we talk about in all of our strikes, whether it's single hand or double punch, we want to be thumbs up. You want to take the elbows, screw them in. Like literally, I, I always have guys put their hands, palms up, and then just do this and just torque your elbows in. 
And what you naturally notice it does, it pulls all your back muscles, it broadens your posture, and it makes you longer and it makes you more powerful. We want to strike with the palm of our hand yeah. and do it the thumb up and be long with that. Does that answer that question? Oh, no, yeah, perfectly, Coach. And then um, I got two more, and then we, let's look at some film and, and a couple things and anything else you want to show is – First, like I, I mean, obviously, I mean, some some of our some of these states are are ahead of the curve or more college oriented in terms of spread passing games and all that little stuff at the high school level. But still, especially in the neck of the woods, I am like the Midwest, where it's still a heavy run atmosphere. Okay, and you don't spend near as much. You spend a lot more time on inside run than you do seven on seven. Um, what are like? three drills say if a coach is limited to say 10 minutes or something okay these are these are three solid drills that i can do for and, and work on pass pro for my alignment absolutely um you know I, i'll talk about them and then I'll, okay. I'll show some film them too um after i think you gotta look at you have to have some form of a redirection drill whether it is a kick 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 to something and then make them at the post um you have to have a strike drill um where you again whether it's it's strike for power double punch brace or it's independent hands however and everyone's different how they teach it um and then you have to have my opinion a twist pickup like so those like we, every practice we do I'll, I'll start with a redirect movement drill and that's how we start practice in our pre-practice right we're kicking kicking post 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 and then in practice we'll add kick 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 punch post now punch um, some version of that drill, um, which we call just triangle drill. And then we will do just stationary, not moving punch stuff every day. Again, double punch, independent, and then we'll transition down the line. Um, and then we will do twist pickup every day. And you can buy that different ways. You can do that as a walk, as a run through, you know, walk through period. You can do that as true drill work. You can do it one on ones versus the D line. Um, but those three, you have to have some version of a redirect drill, okay. some version of a strike drill, and then twist pickup. So again, like Kai, when you talk about, and we'll start with this coach. Okay. So like again, you can do this from a kneeling position. Some guys do this with a ball underneath the knee, which I think is really good. Um, probably something that I'm going to look at more uh, rather than make them have to always do this. But we'll start, you know, we'll start post stretch. We'll do this drill. We don't do this in pre practice. But really, we're just working on driving off the ball, catching with our feet, working the instep as you do one kick. Yeah. And transition now to the redirect, a kick to post. Again, do it on air. And the biggest part of the component, you'll see like some of these guys are doing a really good job. Some of the older guys, some of the younger guys can see are, are not yet, which is okay. So I film it. But you'll see like here the eyes, the high hand, low hand. And then the redirect, just as important as the feet to me, is the eyes. And so many guys, you'll see it, they kind of like lag the eyes back as they move. Yeah. Your eyes got transition. And then we'll just finish that with kick, kick, post, post. Now, you, you mentioned the, the ball drill there, because I've seen that a little bit too, because I remember when I talked to Cody Kennedy last year. Uh, Great coach. He, he, he had some of that stuff too. And like, what do you, what, I mean, I mean, what your opinion, what does the ball give you that this doesn't? Um, I think I think just from uh, like pressure and it's something I got to do, you know, more research on because I haven't I haven't used the ball before. Um, you don't have to get down as far, so yeah. it's, a, it's a little bit less. It's it's easier to develop. Like with some of these guys, like one thing, like I'm, I'm just gonna start doing with I know like Big Nate back here, like he's six eight. So like again, like him getting down to a guy like Rob that was six one, probably maybe not as realistic. Yeah. Um, and then we just finish with two. So, and then again, like, you know, see how it transitions in games, you know, just the explosion out of the stance by the tackles, you know, the ability to do different things. Um, again, like I, I like showing these type of things, the guys after they do a drill, you know, here it is the kick, 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 post, post, post on twist pickup. That's that big kid, Nate. He's, he's a big kid now. Six, eight, he makes me look tiny, like really tiny. <laughs> but showing them just the different ability to do those things. Um, and then like I said, we'll do some type of strike drill. So yeah. it can be 
I'm gonna pull this up. Now I, I can't see why you're pulling that up, coaches. Where do you find six foot foot six foot eight linemen so I just can start looking? <laughs> All over. I, I, so when I recruit a line, I I know I'll, I'll say this, coach. I, I've, I've signed kids here that are six foot. I've signed kids here that are six eight. Yeah. It, it's all about how they move, how yeah. they bend. You know, obviously you want your tackles to be to be bigger, but like to me, the most and maybe it's gonna sound, it's just a genetic thing. Like I want long armed guys. Yeah. So like tackles that are six one that have super long arms are are just as valuable, probably more valuable to me than a six eight tackle, just because you're not giving up all the height. You know, disadvantage and leverage, like going to smaller guy. But generally, the taller they are, the longer their arms are. It's just like kind of genetically how it okay. works. So, but arm length is huge with it. But again, like another, you know, a strike drill. So we'll do this every day. We'll do different strike drills. So this one's just working. You know, partner point to bull. It's working. Double punch, independent punch, um, and then a component I really like is at the end of a lot of our pass drills, we'll always work a bull rush component. So we'll work it where you have to refit your hips, reset your hands. So uh, you can see Nolan here, you know, he's going to simulate getting bold. The better guys will really give a good look with it. Like here, you can see like Andrew here is, is sh so Andrew, for example, Andrew was 5'10", started for me at center. Like was an unbelievable, smartest kid I've ever coached probably. So you can see here again, you're just teaching them how to move, how to bend, how to sink. And this is a good look at Sam. So like this goes back to coach, like what are we strike what they give you? Well, if you get in power move, you're gonna strike with two hands on the chest. Yeah. If you get in speed rush, single shoulder, you're gonna punch that near hand, thumb up with one hand. And then again, like we're gonna sing, 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 you know, we're gonna signify again bold. And we're gonna flop our feet. I, I teach double. I know some people teach single. I, again, everyone's you know right, wrong, wrong, right, wrong. However you teach it, I like to get both feet back on their hips, and then we're gonna come out you know with a bull rush mentality. So that would be like an example of a strike drill that we'll do every day. That's a better look. And again, don't just give up ground. And again, show film of it. So show guys you know again getting a power move. Going two hands, reset his hands, right tackle too. He's, he's giving you his chest, strike with both. You know, again, here, it's probably both tackles again. Like, again, what type of pass rush are they giving you? Like the right tackle here, he's not giving him two, he's not stripping speed, he throws the right hand. Like, take what they give you. You know, strike, get hands on. It's probably both tackles here. Again, like when you look at the types of sets, like with Sam here, Sam set it more vertical because this guy's wider. This guy's a little tighter. Nate's going a little bit quicker to him. But again, like this is a great example to me. Like we want to win contact. We yeah. want to deliver a blow before they do. It's not about reacting to what they do. Get them out of their first move. Like I don't know what 44's plan was. But Nate's 6'8", he's long, throw the hands. Like, get the hands on quick. Sam here is going independent hands. because He's not sure if this guy's going through him. Left hand, right hand. So it's, it's all about that. And then, again, when you look at... Let me pull this up. Thank you, Coach. Thank yeah. And then the twist pick of one. But and I'll show that another time. No. Unless you want... While you're talking, like, I, I've always just been curious. Cause I, I've, I've only seen this one, on, like, the med ball punch stuff on film. Like, yep. what, 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 and I didn't get a chance to read your objective there is, why, why, why are you using a med ball to work on punches? Sure. So, there, there's two reasons for it. Um, for a run game, it's easy. It's kind of like a rounded surface. So, like, rather than, like, a hand shield, it's kind of square. Uh, I think it signifies more grabbing the body. Okay. Um, Maybe I'm soft as an O-line coach. I try to take <laughs> as many hits off my guys' bodies yeah. throughout the week. I know my O-line coach busts bust my shops about it all the time. I don't think it makes you play any less physical. Um, I used to do everything on guys' bodies, so like punch, you know, single. We still do it at times. Um, then when I went down to FIU, Coach Davis had coached the NFL for a long time. Our practices there were much more – they were not soft, and we, we ran very physical practices. 
Um, but it was very much like your players need to be healthy on game day to be better players. So I was like, okay, that makes a lot of sense. So um, what I like about when you like when you throw the med ball, you're striking a, a moving target, and it, it's kind of a, a good realistic look. Okay, colors come at me, boom, snap the hands, boom, snap the hands, thumbs up, strike the palm of the hand. So like, you know, this is just another example of, you know, like a. This is pre-COVID, not having to wear a mask at practice, which I love. I miss that. <laughs> the good old um, days, coach. The good old days. Good old days. <laughs> but, like, it's just – it allows them to strike it. You can see, like, we're going independent here, going back to double. Again, shooting the hands, shoulders out, playing long with the hands. And then you'll move them. Just, like, low-key things. These are things, like, to me, that the guys should be doing all off season. you know. You know, this is something you can do even if you're home. Like, you're doing an internship somewhere. Get a med ball somewhere get something and just work different hand combat with it. Okay. You know, so we'll do this. Um, again, like one is longer than two, two is more powerful than one. So just knowing when, when to use your hands, when to strike. Um, right. Yeah, just the right guard here. You know, just like knowing when you get double, take double. Yeah. So. Now, in the last question for you, you kind of mentioned already um, with twist stuff is is what what moves do you work a lot more, the most in practice? Because obviously you mentioned speed, bull. There's twist. What kind of, what kind of do you think, especially linemen coming out of high school going into college, have, need need the most work on? It's not necessarily trouble, but like okay, they don't have much experience against it, or they need more technique work on. You see so much more in co in college, like and I'm gonna go back to my coach D line. Everything I taught with D line was about one arm stab to tear or back shoulder to flip. Um, I don't think in high school. I think guys are so used to guys leaning on them; they're not used to like stab shock and tear moves so like anything where a D lineman is grabbing you flipping his hips and pulling you so like we work we'll work a lot of stuff where guys are getting like yanked um and it goes back to me like you learning how to play the long that's why you see like in all of our past drills we are like extended the head is out i think so many guys in high school they're so used to they're, they're either longer than guys or they're stronger or they're just not getting a lot of um, speed. And then a lot of high school linemen, depending on the system they play and aren't used to like true pass pro either. Yeah, they, yeah. A lot of them, right? Like, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's, yeah. it, it, it's kind of, you know, the old joke, like, you know, the NFL always says like college or line coaches, they run spread. They're not getting, um, you know, these guys are ready for the NFL. And, you know, I, you hear some college coaches say the same thing. Like, oh, these guys run wing T. <laughs> they have the if they have the attributes, you can coach them. Is yeah. it easier to coach a guy that plays in a spread system or pro system? Sure, you know, but like, you, you can coach them. I've coached, you know, coach triple option guys. You know, th those guys I always joke are probably the toughest. Like triple option no linemen, they really need to show you something because yeah. everything is you know different. Um, but I, I would say the biggest challenge that I always see with high school guys coming to college is they don't know how to stop like the speed counter moves. So like the back shoulder, flip the hips, this, the one arm stab, pull down, you know, um, teaching those guys how to play long. And again, strike first is so important. So, so big. How, and, and then how do you work that in practice and combat that as a result? I mean, I mean, obviously you're going to do, do pod time with your D line coach and the D line. And obviously you're going to work on stuff and, I mean, there's arguments to make, be made that some of those one-on-one -on -one drills are really just defensive drills, and <laughs> I've, been, I've, I've been a D-line animal like coach, coach. I understand it, but yeah. So there's 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 a couple things. Um, <laughs> push pull is always good, right? You have yeah. a grab, pull it. Um, like I said, for me, I I add the component of power stuff to every almost every pass pro drill. So like we're gonna get shocked, so we have to flip, so we need to lock down. Um. One on ones to me, and just my honest opinion, like I don't give a crap if my guys ever win a one on one. Yeah. So like, post games so we play Saturdays in college. Like Sundays we'll watch the film, and my right tackle got beat by speed chop. I'll be like, okay, 
all week in one-on-ones, deny the inside. Make him go outside and give you a speed run. Like, like purposely slow your set. Like, make him go outside of you so that he's constantly working that. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're getting beat with power, okay, well, overset, maybe, like, do what you need to do to get better. We have to get better. Like, that's what one-on-ones are for. And then I'll just share the last thing I'll share, Coach, because I don't okay. probably run now. Um, I started doing this a couple of years ago, and I've been doing it more. Um, I think you got to do different types of hand combat with stuff. And again, you can use boxing gloves. Um, you can just use the lineman grabbing shoulders. And I'll just change it up. So, like, I'll give them, like, okay, target. So, like, we know we're getting back shoulder, you know, back shoulder, stab, or whatever. Like, I'll give them that type of move. And I teach them how to strike it. And then, again, I'll try to add a redirect phase to it. So, it's really teaching them how to hit aiming points. So like, here, Nate, okay, it's post, slam down, twist, pick up. Give them a target. High hand, low hand, right? Near hand's high, low hand's low. Um. I've really grown to like this. You know, some guys might not, you know, they might say it's really like, well, it's just have to do football. I think the more like actual targets you can give them like visually, the better they get with it. And it, it, to me, the best part of it is when, when you're talking about the line different moves, it makes them have to transition their eyes. So like from one movement, like a post to a kick, they got to get their eyes and lock in the target. So like Sam here does a really good job. So like this is something where he's just kicking. Okay, it's twist pickup, boom, boom, coming back with it. Trevor here, awesome job. Kick, kick, boom, boom, coming back. Kick, kick, boom. Like this one's not good by Nate. Like finish your movement. Like he's reaching. His foot is not in the ground. He's reaching for something. Like it teaches them have to move their feet back to where you can get yeah. get to. So your feet always have to be in front of the defender. And then, like, it, again, to me, it, it carries over on film. Like, when you see it in terms of, like, independent hands, like with Sam here. Like, this guy's not rushing down his midline. Go left hand, right hand. Boom, boom. You know, play long with your hands. You know. Same thing here. Sam, 17 goes inside. Left tackle. 17 goes inside. Kick, boom, boom. Switch your target. Switch your hand placement. Not a good job by the right guard, right? Like he's not doing that. Like, so I, I think you just gotta in the center offhand stuff. We can save that for another time. That's that's a whole great topic for me. So, <laughs> oh, so I'm just on to use tools. The center's off. Yeah, no, 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 that's perfect, coach. Like, I mean, kind of kind of the last thing thing before we go is is I mean you you mentioned a lot of things there, and I really like that last drill and all honestly because I, I think especially for like high school kids. Visual, I think high school kids and kids in general, visual is probably more important than anything. Like in the class, like when I, when I break down learning styles of kids, like it's not auditory. Like auditory is not, like it, it's visual or tactile where it's a lot of hands on or a combination of both really. Like it's, you have, you have a small percentage of your student population that are auditory learners. I mean, those typically are your like super high, high academic kids in our class, but that's right. not every, the everyday kid. Absolutely, that's so true. Like, and that, and I think that's kind of where, you know, I, and I think you kind of mentioned a good point, and I, and I made made a note of it is for, for especially for picks for better visuals. Like to your point, I've never really thought about it, and and you're you were also right. It takes a long ass time to put together the stick figure drawings. Like, <laughs> like it, it does. Like okay, how, like how's this look? When in all honesty, yeah. if you just Video take the drills and it just take screenshots and then break down what you need onto the side. It makes it look better, and I think that's I think that's a good. If they, obviously the technique stuff is good too, but if, I think just as important is how we teach it, and I think that's a good way for that, especially high school guys, can, can pick up there. Absolutely, coaches. Um, that's another episode of the Gap Down Backer Podcast. Um, Coach Siasis, um Twitter will be in the bio. Give him a follow. If you want to check out our sponsors and affiliates below, uh, those will be in the bio as well. If you want to support the channel, help things out there. Um, if you want to go back to any specific portion, tags will be in, in the bottom as normal. Click on that. Take you to the, the portion of the video. If you're just listening to the um, audio-only version, again, you can always go on the YouTube channel if you want to see the visuals. Those are all, always also there as well. 
Um, thank you, coaches. And then that was another episode of the Gap Downbacker podcast.